Okay, so we're going to carry on with uh, our next part, which is uh, we have done currently on the physical properties and chemical properties of alkenes in the last uh, session. Now we're going to go into looking at the next segment, which is how we can produce alkenes. Okay, what we've done previously is actually to look at uh, what are the reactions that alkenes undergo. Okay, what are the reactions that alkenes undergo? So what we have done in the previous uh, worksheets was really just to go through all the reactions. Okay, what were the reactions that we've gone through? We have gone through um, that alkenes will actually undergo addition reaction uh, with hydrogen, addition of bromine, addition of steam, and addition of the alkene molecules themselves, which we term as addition polymerization. So this was what we went through in the last segment. Okay, right now, um, we're not going to look at what reactions alkenes undergo. Instead, we're going to look at how we can produce alkene. Okay, so now we, let's get back to slide 26. Hey, no, not 26, sorry, too far. Away. Okay, slide 24. So we're going to look at the, the idea now of cracking. So what is cracking? Okay, by the end of this worksheet, you should be able to describe cracking of petroleum as a method to obtain alkenes. We'll go into further details what cracking is. Okay, you will be able to, um, with sufficient data, okay, determine the products or reactants after cracking. Next, you're going to look at the three important points about cracking. Okay, this one is generally on its application, why we want to do cracking itself. And... This last part, this one actually is like a summary of your alkane and alkene. Okay. Now, this summary, most probably I'll let you all go and do it on your own. Okay. Because it's a consolidation of whatever we've gone through in the previous um, five worksheets. Okay. So let's start with the first question. Okay. So petroleum is a mixture of hydrocarbons which undergo fractional distillation to produce useful fractions. Okay. This is what we went through under intro to organic chem. Okay, under intro to organic chem. Okay, we have actually covered this a little. Okay, however, the demands of the heavier fractions are actually lesser. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these heavy fractions, we're going to break them down into smaller chain hydrocarbons. And this process is what we call cracking. So what exactly is cracking? So cracking, okay, is actually the breaking down. of long chain hydrocarbon. So take note, it's a long chain one. So example, bitumen is a long chain hydrocarbon. Okay, so we break the bitumen down into smaller molecules. So literally you're taking the big, big molecule and just breaking them out into smaller pieces. Okay, so what are the conditions for catalytic cracking? Okay, what are the conditions for catalytic cracking? It is actually about, this time around, it's about 600 degrees Celsius. Okay, it's not very precise per se. It's about, because typically high temperature will be sufficient. Okay, but they will heat it to about 600 degrees Celsius. Okay, and with aluminum oxide and silicon dioxide, so yeah, as I will do huh? as a catalyst. Okay, so it's about 600 degrees Celsius. That's the condition, the temperature you will need to reach. And the two catalysts that they'll be adding is actually silicon dioxide and aluminum oxide. So we're going to write down the general equation of really what happens during catalytic cracking. Okay, so this equation will look kind of weird because there's like a lot of brackets and stuff like this. Okay, but just um, see that this is a, just a general, very okay, general equation for cracking. Okay, that's why the word general is here. So what is happening? We are actually taking the long chain alkenes. Okay, we let it undergo catalytic cracking. Okay, in this case here, actually, we could have written 600 degrees Celsius about comma Al2O3 and SiO2. Okay, this is the condition that you can return on the arrow. Okay, so after you undergo cracking, what we're going to get is a mixture of short chain, al short chain alkenes and 
we will get a mixture. Okay. So you can see uh, there are two, two main things that will happen. Okay, we'll have a mixture of short chain alkenes and we'll have a mixture of short chain alkenes slash hydrogen gas. So either one of them. Okay, either you have your short chain alkenes or you have your hydrogen gas. So this is the general reaction. Now, what's important is remember why we want to study cracking is really because we want to study a method that can produce my alkene. So what you have seen here is that your alkene actually produced alkenes over here. That's why cracking is important. Cracking can produce my alkenes, which I can use for other reactions. Okay, so this is the general um, general word equation, okay, general equation for cracking. So why exactly do we use it for cracking? Okay, why exactly do we do cracking uh, with the long chain hydrocarbons? So the first thing, okay, is that actually we do cracking, as mentioned, we actually learn about cracking so that we can produce our short chain alkenes. Okay, short chain alkenes. So producing the alkenes is one of the important things. Next thing, okay, you'll realize that ch I can actually produce hydrogen gas. Now, hydrogen gas is important. Okay, just like when you have learned about the, uh, the production of ammonia. Okay, if you can look back on that chapter of the pro ammonia production, you realize that they say that hydrogen gas is obtained from the cracking of petroleum. Okay, and this is where you see now hydrogen gas is produced. And this hydrogen gas is actually being sent for ammonia production. Okay, and lastly, cracking, okay, just like bitumen, bitumen, we, I mean, we don't have so many roads to lay bitumen on, right? Hence, what we're going to do is we're going to take that bitumen, the bigger long chain hydrocarbons, and we're going to break it down, okay, into smaller chain that are useful, example, and petrol. You know that a lot of the vehicles that we have on the road uses petrol as the fuel. Hence, it's important to have fuel, right? Hence, we will do cracking on the longer chain and the bigger chains to get our shorter chains, such as petrol. Okay, so that's important. So these are the three main important products that we actually want to get out of cracking. Okay, now let's uh, look a little bit at this application now. Okay, so catalytic cracking can be done in the school laboratory as shown below. So I can have a glass wool soaked in liquid petroleum. I'm going to put this thing called a porous pot here. Okay, broken porous pot. Actually, they contains aluminium oxide and silicon dioxide over here. So as I heat it up, as the petroleum passes through the porous pot, okay, as it passes through the porous pot, okay, it will undergo catalytic cracking. And we will collect the alkane and alkane is a mixture over here. So how can we apply a little bit of this? Generally, the first thing that you need to know is that, of course, is based on equation. Like question one, you know that I can have a long chain alkane being broken down into uh, two other hydrocarbons. In this case here, you got C6H14, you got C4H8. Actually, this is an alkane based on the general formula. This is an alkene based on the general formula. So how do I know what is the long chain alkane that's undergoing cracking? You just add up the number of carbons. So this is C10, H14 plus H8, H22. Okay, so C10, H22 actually undergo catalytic cracking to give you this alkane and this alkene. And of course, the reverse can be true. Okay, if I got an initial C10, H22, I got C4, H8. You can see purposely it's the same one. If you do your subtraction, you get C6, H14 over here. Okay, so. I've shown you an example with question one and two. I want you all to test, take some time now to go and try question three and question four. Okay, maybe about uh, two minutes to just go and try it out. Okay, two minutes to go and try it out. Let's go. Um, so if you have done the calculations, I do take note this three times of C4H8. Therefore, I need to take note that I got C15 at the start. Down here is three times of C4, so actually down here got 12 carbons. Down here got 24 hydrogens. So 15 minus 12, I got C3. H32 minus 24H, 
I got H8 over here. So this C3 H8 plus three times of C4 H8. So that's for part three. Part four, you can see here, there's uh, three different products, but it's still the same thing. Okay, This is about, all about balancing equation, right? So the number of carbon on the left and number of carbon on the right must be the same. So 10 carbons here. Now here you add up, there's also 10 carbons. So therefore, down here got no carbon. H22, down here got 20H. So I'm left here is H2. So you can see here, this is where I mentioned previously that it's possible that your product is hydrogen. Okay. And hydrogen is important because the hydrogen is actually used for ammonia production. Okay. So this is um, what you need to uh, be able to do in terms of applying cracking. The other thing is, Commonly question when I come out, most people kind of stun, uh, don't know what's happening, is when you see the diagram like this. Okay, when they see this diagram, a lot of times people don't know what's the reaction that's happening. Okay, why you soak liquid petroleum in the glass in uh on the wool and then you put porous pot. So this actually is an indicator. When you see this aluminium oxide and silicon dioxide, you must ding, have an exclamation mark. Tell yourself that. Okay, these are the catalysts for cracking. Hence, what's happening here would be catalytic cracking. Okay, so these are some things we need, I need you to identify based on the idea of what cracking is and stuff like this. Okay, so let's go back to slide 24. What we have covered, okay, we have actually uh, we are able to describe cracking of petroleum as a method to obtain alkenes using the general formula over here. Okay, so tick. Are we able to determine the products and reactants of cracking with sufficient data provided? That's actually what we have done on the next page where we are able to, on using looking at the chemical equation, we can find out what are the products, what are the reactants. Uh, we know the three important points about cracking, producing short chain alkenes, hydrogen, and also petrol. Okay, for part four, this one, I need you to go back and do on your own to summarize, consolidate your learning between the differences and the similarities between your alkenes and your alkenes. Okay, so actually we are done. Okay, I say again, we are done with alkenes right now. Okay, after going through slide 24 and 25. Okay, so we're going to press on. Now we're going to go on to alcohols. Okay, the target is that we can complete alcohols by today, if possible. Okay, so let's carry on now. But before that, any questions that you have, let me pause the recording now. Okay, so what is the formula? Just double check your answer. For the first one, it will be CH3OH. This will be C2H5OH. This will be C7H15OH. Okay. The last one will be C21, 2M42, 42H, 43OH. Okay, if my math didn't fail me, this should be all the answers. Okay, so hope that um, you are able to utilize the general formula and know how to uh, work out the formula of the alcohols. Now, this is the next part here. Okay, complete the table on the first four members of alcohol. So there's this one, two, three. And on the next page, there's actually four. Okay, so um. I'm going to help you to write the names of all of them. So this is actually methanol. This is actually ethanol. So you can see here, okay, the ANOL is attached to the one carbon, two carbon. Okay, the meth F. Next one will be prop, propanol. And the fourth one will be butanol. Butanol, okay. So I'm going to also help you with the general formula here because we have actually calculated it at the top. So this C3, CH3OH, this C2H5OH, this C3H7OH, and the last one will be C4H9OH. Now, okay, with all the things that I've actually um, written down for you, I want you to try to draw the structural formula. Try to recall what we mentioned Okay, always remember to draw the carbon chain first, followed by inserting the functional group in. Lastly, you go and make sure that all your carbons have four bonds using hydrogens to attach to it. Okay, so I'm going to give you about maybe uh, two minutes now. Okay, now it's 11.48. We give you an 11.50. Okay, so I'm going to pause the recording. Let's go. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to resume now. So what are the structural formulas for all of these uh, alcohols that we have over here? So the first one, CH3OH, how will it look? So this is only one carbon. Okay, so I have one carbon chain over here, just one carbon. Next, insert the functional group. So I got OH attached to it. Then next, I have to make sure that all my carbons have four bonds. So this carbon currently have only one bond. So I'm going to draw another three more H attached to it. That's why I got CH3OH. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is ethanol. Ethanol is two carbons. So I'm just going to draw two carbons. Next, insert the functional group. Then I have H everywhere. Okay, make sure that all my carbons have four bonds. That's why I'm filling up with H. So this is for methanol, ethanol. Next one we're going to look at is propanol. So I'm just going to straight away now draw it instead of explaining more. So I got three carbons. I got OH attached to it. Then I have hydrogen. Two of them attached to this carbon. Two of them attached to this carbon. And three attached to this carbon. Okay. So this is your methanol. And the last one will be your butanol. We're going to have four carbons. We're going to insert the functional group in and we're going to make sure that all our hydrogens are here. Okay, all my hydrogens to fill up. Okay, so this is my butanol. Now, of course, um, just like alkenes, alkanes, alcohols can also have what we call isomerism, where you have the same molecular formula but they have a different structure. Okay, they have the same molecular formula, but different structure. So we're going to look at two ways to, differ, to determine the different isomers. So we have chain isomerism. It's really about how the carbon chain branch out. Okay. Second thing we're going to look at is this thing called the positional isomerism. Okay, where important groups are moved around the carbon chain. In this case, for alcohols, the important group here is the functional group, which is the OH group. Okay, so I'm going to show you the three, okay, five carbon, uh, the tr uh, for pentanol, so pentanol, okay, so this C5H11OH, there, um, there are three isomers for the five carbons, okay, there are three isomers for the five carbons, so I'm going to show you the three of them. So first thing, because the longest chain is five carbons, so I'm going to draw five carbon, one, two, three, four, five. So my first isomer, I'll put the O and the H over here. So you can see the OH is attached to the uh, last carbon over here. Okay. The second one I'm going to do, okay, I'm going to draw another five chain, five carbon chain. I'm going to attach now my OH to the second carbon. Okay. And I'm going to have my last one, my five carbons. I'm going to have one attached to the third carbon. Okay. This is known as a positional isomerism. I say it's known as positional isomerism. Why? Because if you look at this here, it's not really about the branching of the carbon chain. The carbon chain longest is five. Okay. There's no branching of the carbon chain here. Okay, so all the carbon in a straight row. But the difference between these three isomers is that my OH is attached to the different carbon. This one is to the first carbon, this to the second carbon, this to the third carbon. Actually, they all have a name to it. But let me now just complete it with H to make sure that I have my drawings completed. So this is actually how you're going to do your isomers. Literally draw your carbon chain first. Once your carbon chain is more or less settled, then you fill it up with all the hydrogens. Okay, fill it up with all the hydrogens. Okay, a bit tedious, but important. Okay, because you need to draw the full structural formula. And the last one. So uh, what I'm showing you here is actually to show you how the positional isomerism actually works. Okay, and I'm going to give you the name of all of this. So the, for the first one, for the first one, actually, this OH attached to the uh, carbon here. Actually, you can see it is the uh, the carbon here. We can take it as it's the first carbon. So this is actually a pent the one O because the OH is attached to what we call the first carbon. 
In this case here, this OH is led to the second carbon. So this will actually be called the penton 2 ohm. And of course, this one, needless to say, you will know now that this is called the penta 3 ohm. Okay, because the OH group is attached to the three different positions. Okay. Now, um, I want to look at this longest chain, okay, with three carbons. Just going to give you this one last example. They are going to let you all try the four carbon now. So let's go to this one. So the longest chain being three carbons. So I'm just going to draw my three carbon chain here. Okay. Now, next, I need to know that because my longest chain is three carbons, the only other way I can have, uh, I can have it as a C5H11OH is where branching of the carbon chain must occur. Okay, there's no point branching out to the two carbon at the ends because once you branch out at the end, the longest chain now is considered four carbon. Example, huh? can you see if I do this, this is equivalent to saying this. Okay, because I can rotate the bonds around. Hence, you will never, I say again, you will never attach the carbon to the ends if you talk about branching. Okay, the branching should always occur in the middle. Therefore, the branching actually looks like this now. Okay, so this is actually the carbon frame, the carbon skeleton of this three carbon longest chain. Huh? Next, I need to attach the OH group. Okay, the OH group actually it doesn't matter where I attach to, it's actually the same. So I attach the OH here. Thereafter, I will attach all my hydrogens. I okay, make sure all my carbons have four bonds. So this fella here. Okay, I'm going to give you the name to it. Okay, it is quite a cool name. This is actually called the 2,2-dimethyl uh, proper 1 or right? 2,2-dimethyl proper 1 or Okay, that's what this fella is called. Okay, right, now I don't need you to draw for me the four carbons uh, to draw four isomers of the four carbon chain. Okay, I want you to just go and try to give me two. Okay, two possible combination of the four carbon chain. So I'm just going to draw the carbon skeleton first. Okay, so this is the four carbon skeletons. Okay, so what I want you to do is find out how can the branching occur. Next, find out um, how can they be different isomers, okay? So consider chain isomerism, consider functional group isomerism. I'll give you all about two minutes to do this, okay? We'll come back at about 12. Okay, so let's pause. Okay, so I'm not sure how many of you actually got it, but um, what we're gonna, the first one would be having the OH attached to the first group, ready to the first carbon. Then I have a carbon branching out over here. Okay, this is actually called a but this guy. Okay, I mean, I'm not going to draw the hydrogen. Uh, you can do complete on hydrogen. But this fella here will be actually called a 2-methyl butan 1 ohm. Okay, because the OH is attached to the first carbon, then the methyl group is attached to the second carbon. The next one, I'm going to have it the OH here. Okay, I'm going to have the OH over here. So yeah, let me use the blue color again. So OH attached here. I'm going to have the carbon attached here. So this one, this fella now, is known as a 3-methyl butan one ohm. Now, some of you will start to say, sure, sure, then my carbon I attach here, lah. then OH here. This then this will be called a four metal butane one ohm. Remember this: the branching cannot occur at the last or the first carbon. Okay, because if I put it here, actually my longest chain now becomes five. So therefore, this is not correct. Okay, you can attach carbon here. So right now, the next one, since my OH is on the first carbon, now I put my OH at the second carbon. Okay, so I'm doing a positional isomerism now. The first two, actually, I'm looking at is the uh struct is the chain isomerism where we look at the branching. For this one over here, okay, actually what we're looking at now 
would be the functional isomerism. So I'm going to put the OH group in the second carbon. I'm going to put the carbon on the second carbon as well. So this is known as a 2-methyl butane 2 or Okay, I think you get a sense of it, what's going to happen. So I can actually attach OH here as well. Same thing on the second carbon. But my branching occurs on the third carbon. So this is now called a 3 methyl butan 3 or a butan 2 or Okay, I don't need to, you to know how to name it. Okay, so in case you're a sketcher, how to know how to name it. Ah, don't worry, I don't need you to know how to name it. But I need you to be able to see, okay, through the name. Uh, you can see where why are these considered isomers because of the positions of the OH group because of where the branching occurs okay I don't know second carbon or third carbon okay, so the naming actually gives you a bit of a clue of the differences between the various isomers for these four carbon okay so right now to end off worksheet one so we're going to state the five characteristics of a homologous series so what are the five so first thing, of course, because they are all in the same homologous series, they must have the same functional group. So they have the same functional group. Uh, we actually written this before. Huh? Same functional group. And because they're the same functional group, they have similar chemical properties. They react in the same way. Next, there's a gradual change in their physical properties. Okay physical properties. Okay, as we go down the series from one member to the next, members of the same homologous series have the same general formula. That's why we can determine their chemical formulas based on the general formula. And last one, one member to the next actually differs by a CH2 group or a CH2 unit. Okay, so this is um, end of worksheet one. So what we have done we have actually learned how to describe OH group, uh, the alcohols as a homologous series with the hydroxyl group attached. We learned how to use the, fun the general formula. We learned how to look at the first four members of the alcohol group. And hence, and then later, we actually did a little bit of isomerism. Okay, using chain isomerism and looking at functional isomerism. Okay, functional group isomerism. So that's what we did in this worksheet now, in worksheet one. We're going to look at worksheet two next. Okay, so worksheet two, now we're going to examine the physical properties of your alcohols. Then we're going to go on to the reactions. Well, a good thing for alcohols is that they only have two main reactions. Combustion, which all your organic compounds undergo. The other one is actually oxidation. We're going to go into depth into um, the, the oxidation of the alcohols itself. Okay, so let's start. So alcohols... Okay, are uh, covalent compounds. They actually exist as volatile liquids at room temperature. So they are volatile liquids. Huh? So typically you'll see them as liquids. Okay, most of them. Uh, especially the... <clears throat> you'll see most of them, uh, in the, your first four members are actually your liquids. Okay, however, like all hom other homologous series, they actually show gradual change in their physical properties and when you go down the homologous series. So stay and explain the change in the physical properties when going down the series. So when going down the series, what happened to the physical properties? Okay, the physical properties, okay, such as the solubility, when you go down the series, actually decreases. Okay, so the solubility of alcohol actually decreases. So it's becoming less and less soluble in water. Okay, as you go down the series. Explanation. The explanation here actually is just very simple. Okay, because when you go down the series, the molecular size increases. So, the intermolecular force of attraction increases. Right? So, because of the intermolecular force increasing, hence the thing becomes less soluble. Okay, we will, You will only study about this force of attraction, how it dissolves more details in tertiary education. Now. Next one, the trend going down the series, the boiling point actually also increases. Okay, instead of decrease now, the boiling point actually increases. Reasoning, same as what you see in alkanes, same as what you see in alkenes. Really, as you go down the series, you see, I will always write this as the first sentence because the molecular size increase. So, 
the intermolecular I'm going to write short form, force of attraction increase. Therefore, more. Okay, therefore, more. Hey, why don't you so argue? Therefore, more energy is required. Okay. To overcome the force of attraction. Okay. So, this is what we have over here to explain the physical properties. Okay, so just take note of that. Next, we're going to go on into the chemical reaction. Okay, chemical reaction. So this is where you're going to have someone to do a bit of balancing again. Um, I'm going to show you how to balance for ethanol first. A okay, simple one, C2H5OH. We know that combustion is the reaction of the organic compound with, uh, with oxygen. And my product will be carbon dioxide and water. The way how you balance it is the same. You will do carbon, then you do hydrogen, then you do oxygen. But just that, one thing to take note, there's actually oxygen within the organic, uh, within the alcohol itself already. So how to balance, see this. Huh? So C2, so I need two carbon here. So it's two CO2. Hydrogen, take note, there's actually a hydrogen attached to the OH, at the OH group there. So actually I got six hydrogen. So I need three. Uh, H2O here. Now in terms of oxygen, I got 4 due to CO2. I got 3 due to H2O. So I got 7 oxygen. But I must minus 1 from the alcohol first. So I'm left with 6 oxygen to balance. Therefore, I put a 3 over here. So take note for hydrogen when you're balancing, must be careful of the H from the OH group. When you're balancing oxygen, must take note of the O from the OH group. So I'm going to write it down. Okay, you can write it down also. Okay, for this two, be careful in calculating due to OH group in alcohols. Okay, so I want you to go and try now butanol, hept uh, heptanol. Okay, write down what's the balance chemical equation. Okay, this one, because you need to balance a bit, I'll give you three minutes. Okay, so three minutes to go and work it out. So now it's uh, 12 10. We'll resume at 12 13. Okay, 12 13. Let's go. Okay, so uh, I hope you have uh, done this properly and able to get to your final answer. So I'm going to use red to show you the balancing. So I got four. So let's look at butanol first. So C4H9OH plus O2, I got CO2 and H2O. Let's balance the carbon first. So C4, so I need four carbon here. Down here, I got 10, okay, 10 hydrogen. So I need five H2O. Total on the right-hand side, I got eight plus five, eight plus five oxygen. So that's 13 oxygen on the right-hand side. Minus 1 because of the oxygen from the OH group. So I left with 12. So I need to put a 6 over here. So this is the balanced chemical equation for my butanol. Next one. Let's use look at the heptanol. So I need 7 hydrogen. I need 7 carbons. I got 16 hydrogen. So I need 8 over here. If I go and count the number of hydrogens, I got 14 plus 8. I got 22 oxygens. How to do my balancing? So 22 oxygens here. Now here I got one, so I left 21. So I'm going to put a 21 over 2 over here to do the balancing. Now you can't write fraction in your balancing equation. Nah. That's not what um that's not what we are gonna do. Okay. So that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna just make sure that we balance out the whole thing to remove all the fractions. You can't have fractions, huh? So I'm gonna multiply two throughout. So your final answer. Okay, it will be the one in green. So, sorry, uh, let me do this here like this. So actually one, 21 over two, seven and eight. I'm gonna multiply two throughout. So it's gonna be two, 21, 14 and 16. This will be the final answer. All right, this will be the final one. Okay, so once you've done this balancing for combustion, we're gonna go on to the next page. Okay, I think this will be nearing to the end already for the reactions of alcohols. Okay, so let's press on.
So alcohols undergo oxidation with oxidizing agent to form an organic compound from another homologous, homologous series. Or the organic compound formed from the oxidation of alcohols. Okay, you know that alcohols after oxidation will not form alkane alkenes because you learned that, right? So this actually will actually form your carboxylic acid. So when you oxidize alcohol, you will actually get carboxylic acid. So you what you want, maybe you want to write down at the side here, oxidation. So when alcohol undergo oxidation, you actually get your carboxylic acid. Okay. So what's the chemical equation? Okay, in terms of the carboxylic acid oxidation. Oh, sorry, in terms of the et ethanol oxidation. Huh? So this is going to look a bit weird, but don't worry about it. Okay, so I'm going to draw my ethanol first because they want me to do the oxidation for ethanol. So ethanol looks like this. Okay. Now, when I have my oxidation, when I have my oxidation, so I will need to add oxygen to it. Okay, so it looks kind of weird because when you add oxygen to it, we are going to use a square bracket with the O. Okay, why is it that we're not using like the compound name and whatsoever? It's really because the oxidation reaction is not that simple. Lah. So we are uh, simplifying it by just having the bracket with the O. Okay, your end product after oxidation, you're going to have your carboxylic acid. Okay, you're going to have your carboxylic acid. And you're going to have water forming. Okay, sorry, I need to draw the full structural formula. So let's have it like this. Okay, now if you look at it down here, I actually have three oxygens. Down here, I only got one. So I need to put two over here to balance it. So this is the chemical equation to show you the oxidation of my ethanol. Now, the interesting here is that it's not just having oxygen there. Typically, you'll need to heat up the substance for the oxidation to occur. Okay, so let's have a try. Okay, how will, um, after undergoing oxidation, okay, how will, what will happen to my propone one ore? So this one at the top, we know that ethanol is going to become ethanoic acid. Now we're going to try now, what if I start off with propane one all? So C, 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 I'm going to have OH over here. H, 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 H. H. So this is my propane one all. Okay, what happens if it undergoes oxidation? Okay, I want you to go and try it out. Okay, maybe just take one minute. So to go and finish this up. Okay, one minute, start now. Let's go, quickly, quickly. So if you see this, okay, what actually is happening is that if you look at the previous example, what did we do? We actually removed the two H to convert to a double bond O. So same thing, the carbon that's attached to OH, we're going to remove the two hydrogen and convert it to a double bond O. So three carbons here, OH. This carbon here, I'm going to put double bond O. Then the rest I'll put H plus H2O. This is actually my propanoic acid. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this question, okay, because uh, you don't really need to know. Okay, so this is the oxidation of propyl one all to form my propanoic acid. Part five is actually the application. Okay, so what can we do to after knowing how oxy, uh, oxidation of alcohol uses is how okay how are we able to apply this reaction right? So one way it actually use is using breath analyzer. So if breath analyzer contains acidified potassium manganate 7, so this guy here is actually purple. It's a purple color solution, okay? But maybe you have it purple color in the breath analyzer. What's going to happen when, okay, if alcohol is present? So we know that potassium manganate 7 is purple. It is also actually an oxidizing agent. And we know based on what we have seen at the top here, the alcohol will react with the oxidizing agent. Okay, alcohol will actually react with the oxidizing agent. So we know that alcohol can react with my oxidizing agent. So potassium manganate 7 is an oxidizing agent. It will react with alcohol. When potassium manganate 7 reacts, what actually happens? We know that the KMnO4 
which is a potential magnetic seven, okay, when it reacts, it will turn from purple to colorless. Okay, so we know this reaction under redox. Hence, if my breath analyzer contains KMnO4, when a guy drinks too much alcohol and breathes into it, you know that the vapor of the alcohol vapor from the mouth or okay, from the breath will actually cause the KMnO4 to turn from purple to colorless. So we're going to write that down. So how does the police detect the presence of alcohol? When the driver breath Oh, sorry, not when the driver breath, driving breath. Oh my goodness, tired. Okay, when the uh, breath of the driver, oh, sorry, not breath of the driver, when the alcohol, okay, when the alcohol vapor from the driver's breath come into contact, with the potassium with the acidified potassium manganate 7 acidified potassium manganate 7 it will cause it will cause the KMnO4 to turn from purple to colorless. Okay, so when he breathes out alcohol and it comes in contact with the KMnO4, it will actually cause the KMnO4 to turn from purple to colorless. Okay, that's why the breath analyzer works. You can see there's an observable change for you to know whether alcohol is present. Okay, so this is actually how your breath analyzer works. Um, I'm not sure if it really contains my CD5 potassium manganate 7. Okay. Uh, most probably it's another substance, but the general idea of how it works is quite similar to this. Lah. Okay. So let's go on next page 30. Okay, so we have gone through the reaction ready. Now we're now we're gonna look at really how we can obtain alcohol. It okay, is ready the last page. Ready. This is the last page oh, we're gonna go through for today. So there's only one, there's only two main reactions that alcohols undergo. Alcohols undergo, which is combustion and oxidation. Now we're gonna look at how we can obtain alcohol. So we're gonna look at how we can obtain ethanol from the catalytic addition of steam on ethene to ethene. Okay, this one actually we've covered in alkene. Yeah? Second one, we're gonna learn a new reaction called fermentation. Okay. This one actually quite interesting because you can do it at home to produce your own alcohol. And the last one, we're going to really just state some uses of ethanol, huh? of your alcohol. Okay, so let's start. In the previous chapter, ethene undergo catalytic addition reaction with steam to form ethanol. What's the addition of steam also known as? We know that this is known as hydration because it's the addition of steam, which is water. So that's why it's called hydration. What are the conditions? We know it's 300 degrees Celsius. We know it's 60 ATM. Okay, and we know that we're going to use phosphoric 5 acid. Okay, as your catalyst. Okay, so this is the reaction here that we will actually let the um, alkene undergo, the ethene undergo to form my ethanol. So what's the equation? How does it look? Okay, so we're going to have my Ethene. Okay, I'm just going to really shortcut and just run through the whole thing for you. Lah. So ethene. I'm going to add water to it. HOH. -H. Okay, we've gone through a bit of details already. We're going to write 300 degrees Celsius, 60 ATM. And I'm going to write the phosphoric 5 acid. Okay. Phosphoric 5 acid, H3PO4. And my product will be this. Okay, so you can see here, this is now my ethanol. Okay, draw and name the two possible products from the catalytic addition of but one in. I'm just going to draw but one in for you. 
Okay, I just want you to go back and uh, try this on your own. I'm not going to go through this because we have actually gone through quite a bit of this in detail in the Elkin segment. Okay, so this one, please go back and practice a bit more on your own. So we know that to produce ethanol, we can actually use uh, the addition reaction with steam okay, from ethene, which is what we have shown over here. So that's one way. Through hydration, we can obtain ethanol. This is nothing new. We're covered in alkenes. The one that's really new is actually on slide 31. Okay, page 31 now. Okay, so ethanol can be produced by this thing called fermentation. And of what thing? Glucose solution. So we're going to do fermentation of glucose solution as shown in the diagram. This could be done in the lab or even back at home. Huh? And we know the byproduct is carbon dioxide. Okay, so write a balanced chemical equation for the fermentation of your of your glucose solution, okay, to produce ethanol. So this is the balanced chemical equation. We will first have C6H12O6 equals because it's a glucose solution. <coughs> we will put yeast as the catalyst to let the whole reaction run. Okay, and our product will actually be C2H5OH. This is your ethanol. You can have two of them. And because there's water there, so it dissolves in it. So it's aqueous. Plus, I'm going to have two carbon dioxide gas. Two molecules of carbon dioxide gas evolving. So one glucose is going to give me two units of ethanol and two units of CO2. Okay, so this is a balanced chemical equation. We convert glucose into ethanol. Okay, so this cool stuff, you can actually try it back home. You can actually get a bottle of your uh, poka. Okay, I don't sell poka, but in case you... Okay, poka, maybe you can have the... I was telling the class, Kyoho grape. Okay, then you can buy yeast and then add it in and you cap it. Okay, but make sure for your cap, you drill a hole. Okay, so that the air, as you ferment, it will come out. Huh? Otherwise, the whole bottle will explode huh, when you ferment. Okay, so you can actually try this back at home with yeast inside. Okay, so how exactly is the process of fermentation? Okay, what are the steps actually? That if I want to describe, okay, the whole fermentation process, what should I write? So first thing, your glucose solution is actually mixed with yeast. Okay, like what you've seen in the diagram. And the mixture is actually kept at a temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, this is actually the optimum temperature for those of you doing bio. So you know that optimum temperature. Okay, the concept of optimum temperature. Huh? And during fermentation, what actually happens is that carbon dioxide gas is produced. Okay, hence we will see the idea of froth. Okay, hence frothing. Okay, frothing, you'll see like uh, this white foam at the top. Okay, can be observed in a flask. And this carbon dioxide gas will actually go into the lime water as indicated here. Okay. And we will see a white precipitate because carbon dioxide plus a lime water, you know that white precipitate will form. Now, when the whole reaction is happening, these are the things, these are the observable. Okay, sorry. In the description, okay, so this is what, this is like the preparation. This is like what happens. Okay, together with this, huh? so what happens? Huh? So prep ready, you know carbon dioxide gas is produced. The other one that will be produced is actually your ethanol. So in an actual fact, of when you do your fermentation, you actually only get a dilute solution of ethanol. Okay, and it's only up to 15%. Okay, only up to about 15% concentration. Okay, about 15% is actually quite good because your wine is about 15%, I would say. Okay, so... The issue is why is it only up to 15%? It's really because when the concentration of ethanol exceeds this amount, okay, the yeast will actually die. Okay, and fermentation will stop. Okay, so we know that maximum 15% are if you just let it undergo this fermentation process. However, we do know that you have learned separation technique. So ethanol. Actually, I can get it out from the mixture. So what I can do is ethanol from this liquid mixture can actually be obtained by using fractional distillation. Okay, so I can use fractional distillation. 
to cause it to become uh, more concentrated. Okay, if you are good at this, actually you can even make it up to go up to uh, maybe close to 98, 99%. Okay, actually quite cool. Okay, now part C, explain why the temperature of the mixture should be kept to about 37 degrees Celsius. Why? It's really because the enzymes, okay, it's not really the yeast. The yeast actually produce enzymes. Okay, so the enzymes in yeast, in the yeast, okay, works best at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you realize the term optimal temperature is not used here because it's a more of a bio concept. Generally, we just need to know that it's working best at 37 degrees Celsius. Work best. Okay. If temp is raised beyond 37 degrees Celsius, okay, the enzymes will denature. Okay, so denature is like a new word to some of the chemistry students who do physics. But for the bio students, it's nothing too new. Okay, so if the enzymes are denatured, comma, it will not be able to catalyze the reaction. And fermentation will stop. Okay, for those doing bio, you realize that cha, I should also learn to explain what if the temperature is below 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, but it's not expected for chemistry students. Uh, below 37, actually, the enzymes get uh, inactive or less active. That's why the reaction will actually be slower. And if you drop it to low enough temperature, it will become inactive. So, so the reaction doesn't even work. Okay, so that is the why temperature should be kept at 37 degrees Celsius. Now, there are two precautions, okay, to prevent the ethanol from being oxidized. In part D, it says, if I got oxygen and bacteria from the air, it will actually cause my ethanol to be oxidized to ethanoic acid. Ah, this is not good. Huh? Hence, it will have a sour taste. So sometimes wine, when you leave it out for too long, it will actually turn sour. It's really because ethanoic acid is formed. It becomes a vinegar. So what are the two precautions that we should take? First thing, we got to make sure that the rubber bunk, okay, the rubber bunk is secured tightly to the flask. So I'm going to show you, okay, the diagram again. So this is the first precaution I'm going to highlight in green here. Okay, sorry, this is not highlight. Uh, highlight in green over here. Okay, so you can see the rubber bung actually secures the, the you use the rubber bung to secure the flask tightly. Okay. Second thing that we will actually do is, okay, we actually set up this thing called the air trap. How do we set up the air trap? Actually, you put lime water. So the lime water, okay, sorry for using the wrong color. Let me just change back to green. The lime water in the test tube prevents air from entering the apparatus. Or you can say preventing air from entering the reaction mixture. Okay, so what do we mean by that? If you look back at the diagram, you realize that because the liquid level is up to the tube here, air cannot go inside. Cannot, cannot go inside. But the air from produced, the carbon dioxide produced here can actually bubble out. Okay, can you bubble out. So this is actually quite interesting here because we call this concept an uh, air trap. And this precaution too is actually setting up an air trap. Okay. Now, lastly, okay, this is really the last part already. Now we know how fermentation works. Okay, you need to know how to describe them. You know that ethanol can be produced maximum up to 15%. And really the last part here is ethanol is actually very useful uh, all around us. So where can we find the uses of ethanol? Firstly, ethanol is actually in our alcoholic drinks. Okay, so people like to drink alcoholic drinks. I don't know why, but yes. Okay, so we can actually find ethanol in alcoholic drinks. Okay, but they have to be careful because they can be addictive. They can actually cause uh, damage to your liver. Okay, because ethanol is actually not uh, really good for our health. Uh. Next, we can actually use it as a solvent. Okay, use it as a solvent to dissolve substances. So typically this, when ethanol is used as a solvent, is mainly for perfumes. Okay, so perfumes actually has ethanol within it. Okay, our deodorant, cologne, okay, and etc. So all your nice smelling stuff 
because it's evaporating easily. Okay, that's why it can dissolve the scent, the essence, and it evaporates easily to let the essence and the scent actually diffuse around. And the last one, ethanol actually is used as a fuel. Okay, used as a fuel. So um, I'm not sure whether you've read the news. It's actually US actually um, have maize farm. Okay, maize farm actually is like similar to corn. They actually tap on this maize to produce ethanol. Okay, and ethanol is actually used as fuel in their vehicles. So actually quite cool. Okay, you can really see how this tree really works out in terms of the uses of ethanol. Okay, so this really marks the end of our ethanol already. We have covered the ethanol stuff. Okay, okay so let me now stop the um, recording.